Welcome everyone to Artists Honoring Women, season two, episode four. We're very excited to have you all here joining us for this conversation. Uh, my name is Amanda Rawson and I will be uh, uh, representing uh, womanhood this, this evening. So let me start uh, with our land acknowledgement. <clears throat> we would like to begin this program by recognizing that while we gather in the Santa Clara County, we are gathered on the ethno-historic tribal territory of the Tamian Ohlone who were related to the direct ancestors of the lineages enrolled in the Muwekma Ohlone tribe. The lands on which Santa Clara County are established continues to be of great significance to the Muwekma Ohlone tribe of the Bay Area. We also recognize that the ancestors of the Muwekma Ohlone constructed and maintained the three Bay Area missions, Santa Clara, San Jose, and San Francisco. Thank you. <clears throat> so what is womanhood? Uh, I want to welcome those who who already have been uh, participating and listening in on our our uh, past conversations and previous first season. Uh, but for those of you who are new to womanhood and this is your first time joining us, welcome. Uh, I want to start by sharing with you that womanhood is a project that was launched in 2020 by the Santa Clara County Office of Women's Policy. It is a public art and digital media project that works with artists to commission interactive educational art that promotes historical contributions of women across all intersectional identities. The Womenhood Project, it's gonna, it will continue the conversation on women's recognition through public art. This will happen through community engagement throughout the county to learn what women we should honor, how we should honor the women and where should we be honoring these women. In February of this year, 2022, we started the first pilot temporary public art project in downtown San Jose called Womanhood Anonymous No More. This downtown San Jose artist, res is an art, uh, artist res residency excuse me, that honors women's contributions to San Jose. The goals for this pilot project were to continue the conversation around women's recognition through public art. This project is a start to other contemporary projects that will develop as we continue to do research and reach out to the communities across the county to learn which women and groups we should honor, how we should honor them, and where, of course, they should be honored. The temporary public art projects that started in San Jose, uh, but this is one that started in San Jose, but it will continue to spread across the county to, ex to explore through community engagement uh, pop-ups on how permanent projects can take form. We're very excited about this project and we're looking forward to how we can continue this work in the other districts. So what is Artists Honoring Women? That's what we're here for today. Uh, I wanna welcome you, like I said, to season two, episode four of Artists Honoring Women. Last year, we highlighted seven artists across the nation, a nation whose work, art and advocacy explored what recognition in public art looks like while re reconsidering issues of representation and cultural equity. This season, we will highlight local 13 artists from the Womanhood Downtown San Jose Artist Residency Projects, who commemorated 25 women who contributed to quality of life in downtown San Jose, Santa Clara County, and to its art sector. So we continue season two with conversations with three of the artists. First, I would like to introduce Sofia Arredondo, one of our Downtown San Jose Artist Residents uh, for Womanhood Anonymous No More. Sophia is a lifetime resident of San Jose and a teaching artist. Her mantra is life is short, make art first. Sophia is inspired by her wide interest and passion for arts, art, crafts, history, design, and fashion. Her artwork is heavily influenced by symbols and iconography related to Chicana and Chicano visual arts, family storytelling, cultural, and contemporary influences. For over nine years, she has run Si Senorita Studios, bringing original art apparel and one-off accessories to local art events, pop-ups, and Etsy. Welcome, Sophia. Thank you, Amanda. Yes, we're excited to see what you have to share with us today. And afterwards, you and I will go ahead and have a conversation. Awesome, all right. So hello, everyone. My name is Sophia Redondo. Um, I am sharing with you my artwork here um, where I'm honoring Carmen Castellano, who is a philanthropist and advocates for the arts, especially for Latinos in Santa Clara Valley. 
And I was initially drawn to honoring Carmen Castellano because of her impact personally on like my life. Um, I was, you know, I had the honor of getting a grant from the Castellano Family Foundation um, not too long ago, about in 2017, for my students. Um, so I teach high school art at Lincoln High School, and um, my students needed art supplies. And when I applied, we were fortunately able to get money for them. And when I was an undergrad student at San Jose State and I was studying art, um, the Castellano Foundation also was able to um, give me money for a scholarship through the Dr. Ernesto Galarza Scholarship Program, also at San Jose State. Um, so, you know, she has, you know, her and her family have also provided for me and my educational goals. So when I learned about womanhood and the Womanhood Project and um, honoring women who have made a significant difference, um, I immediately thought of Carmen Gassiano and um, her family and what they've done for the community. So when I created this art piece in honor of her, I thought about um, the memorial that they had for her. She recently passed away in 2020 and um, they had a Dia de los Muertos themed uh, celebration of life for her at San Jose City College where she used to work. And the celebration for those who are not familiar with Dia de los Muertos, it's a celebration of life. Um, it's not meant to be sad. It's meant to be happy and honoring and welcoming of those that have passed away. Um, uh, folks that follow and celebrate Dia de los Muertos, it's on November 1st and November 2nd of every year. And it's believed that the, the you know souls of our loved ones return to the land of the living and they come back to be celebrated and to spend time with their families. So um, in this celebration, I I know that papel picado is a folk art that is used um, to decorate the altars that are made for the deceased. And so in creating Carmen Castellano's art piece, I wanted to create a papel picado with her portrait in it. And I wanted to include symbols that represent um, her philanthropy values. And um, so what I started as like initial rough drafts here, um, this is my initial mood board. I quickly looked up images that I liked of her that I could make a portrait out of. And I looked up designs for papel picado backgrounds. I have never made like, it's a wood or not a wood cut, a paper cutting. I've never made this myself. I know how intricate it can be, but I wanted to create something digitally that would resemble the papel picado. So on the bottom, I began to put symbols. The sun uh, is actually the logo from the Castellano Family Foundation. And the rose is, um, you know, symbolic of remembrance. And I was including, um, you know, a symbol for the arts and for education. And um, I ended up, you know, changing it later. But this was my initial sketch. And then as I worked through it, I realized I wanted her portrait to stand out. So when I started to develop Carmen's portrait further, I looked up um, silkscreen artists and I wanted her portrait to be more colorful and vibrant, just like the celebration of Dia de los Muertos is. And so I chose um, vibrant purples um, and pinks and greens in the end. Um, I just started with blues 
and more subtle colors, I think, just as I was drawing. And all of this was done using my iPad and the Procreate app and um, an iPen, iPad pen. So as I continued and developed the color scheme, this is what ended up becoming the final art piece. Super vibrant, um, reflective of colors that are used for Day of the Dead altars and celebrations. And I zoomed in so you could see um, symbols of, that represent the arts, which she was a big supporter of, Latinos in the arts. So theater, dance, um, music. And then I also included um, a butterfly and I included her name here at the top. So, I mean, I was pretty pleased with, I, I don't usually do digital art and I was pretty pleased with the outcome. <laughs> so um, this was a project that I was excited to, to do, but I was also a little nervous. I'm gonna be honest because I don't, I do create digital art, but it's been a while since, um, you know, I am a, a new mother and I've been wanting to create art, but it's been difficult. And so this is the first piece that I was really excited about creating. And I really hope that I did Carmen justice in this piece. So I hope I hope people enjoy it and they go visit it in downtown San Jose on Post Street. Thank you. That was fantastic. I appreciate you sharing your slides with us and, and your story um, and your connection with the Castellano Foundation and the family. Um, I have to say, when I was reading your bio, Sophia, I was remembering when I first met you, and you probably don't even remember, but it was years ago. I was, I, I, I think I was working maybe at the Quilts Textile Museum at the time, and um, I bought your tank top with your, um, with your slogan, Life is Short, Make make art first and I still wear it. And, then, and so I just, I love that. Um, and I mentioned it because you talked about how you stopped making art and this is the first thing you've done for a while because you're living life, right? You're a new mom mm -hmm. and you're teaching and you're doing all these these things um, to continue going on. And it just, it, it, to me, I see a parallel between, um, you know, where, when I first met you and to, where you, to what you're sharing now and just, how um, this, how Carmen was able to, she was a mother and she had to work and she was involved in the arts in her own way. And um, I remember learning about her story before this and, and her husband, Al Castellano's uh, story and their kids. And um, I think, uh, I think what I wanted, wanted to ask you was, um, did you recognize that kind of, that kind of connection early on when you first learned about Carmen Castellano and the Castellano Foundation? Um, would you say that's what kind of encouraged you to stay like engaged and learn and, and, and recognize her? I guess maybe subconsciously. I don't <laughs> think I realized it until I was actually creating the art piece, like how full circle it was. <laughs> and, um, you know, it, she, you know, had an amazing life. She and her husband have done so much for our community and the impact that they've made in such, you know, a lifetime really um, and the impact their children are making continuing the foundation it's amazing oh. and and I think now I fully appreciate I can appreciate now being older um, and starting my own family I can appreciate you know how much you know people in our community really contribute and really want to make a difference and it is inspiring because you you want to do the same for your right. students for for your community and so um yeah it's it's really amazing so you uh mentioned that when you heard about the womanhood project you already knew who you wanted to recognize mm -hmm. so when you you know i know that a list was provided of uh women to choose from so when you saw Carmen on there, did you like say, oh, that's exactly who I was thinking about? <laughs> Basically, yeah. I was like, I mean, yes. I love that. I love that. And it's, you know, um, 
I know her, I know the family, I, I knew Carmen and um, it was really tough to hear her passing. You know, that was a big loss in the arts community in San Jose for the Latino community and the arts that were supporting the young Latinos trying to come up um, and find their way through you. I think you did it really well through those, the, through those symbols. I was writing notes through the um, music, dance and, and theater and performing arts. You know, I think it's incredibly important that um, somebody like her is kind of, is still being recognized and and um, talked about. So I guess my my next question is, have do, do your students know who she is? Have you is this somebody you've you've shared and um, with them about you know the type of people that are actually in our community trying to help? Well, I did share with them about the women's uh, womanhood project. They are currently working on a womanhood project right now. <laughs> so I can't wait to share, hopefully in a couple of weeks, what they've you know worked up. Um, but I did share the website with them and to help them start their research. And I remember a couple of them were selecting Carmen Castellano and like reading up on her. So I think a handful of them have read it, but um, I, I haven't shared with them, you know, outside of, you know, what yeah. I've told them. Um, yeah. yeah. And um, I, I, I actually, we have a couple of, uh, so a couple of the artists that are part of this residency are teachers, are art teachers in, in high school. And this is, it's been great to hear, um, this is the second time I've heard that the, uh, a teacher in, the, in our residency is doing something with womanhood. Sorry, we have four teachers, and I'm, I'm, I'm four high school teachers that I I'm think I can remember remember in the moment right now <laughs> are doing things with their students around this, around womanhood, which I think is amazing, right? Because this is, this is exactly what we are saying is um, how do we continue to tell the stories of those women that are part of our community in in these smaller ways, but very impactful ways, right? It's not mm -hmm. like, oh, we're gonna go and create this. Uh, we're not creating a statue for them per se right now in this moment, mm -hmm. but we are spreading their stories um, through the students, through the youth. And, and that's how, I mean, it's just reminding me of what I just, mentioned to you when we started this conversation is that full circle right because who's going to be the student in your class that's going to do what you're doing and you know maybe it ends up being you that they recognize the way that you're recognizing yeah. carmen you know yeah exactly and i think that's why this project's so great i mean photographs they're like gold to my family you know you have a photograph of someone in your family and you know you you know that story from oral history from right. your family sharing stories and what we're doing as artists right now we're taking photographs we're taking knowledge about these individuals and then we're creating something special that can be shared with everyone yeah. and and hopefully later on rediscovered about these individuals um so that they are not forgotten and they are commemorated and celebrated as they should be. And, you know, there's a record of it. That's what art does. It creates a record. So we have it forever. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I, I, I wanted to ask one more thing because I, you did say something that caught my attention was that um, you did something, you worked with, with a, a um, an art form that was not, or you haven't done it for a while, or you look, you had to look up like, um, uh, what was I writing down? I was writing down um, uh, for the, okay, obviously the papel picados, mm -hmm. right? You said you didn't, you've never done it before and then you're using your mm -hmm. iPad. So how has um, your relationship to art and um, your art practice changed with this or maybe even before this? I mean, it's it's always been a learning process, especially as an artist, I think in this day and age, like I, I was trained traditionally, like in studio arts, you know, uh, pen, paper to, um, you know, pen to paper, uh, brush to canvas. And so I wasn't really introduced to, you know, drawing on the computer mm. and to college. And, you know, then I was struggling because my computer was too old because <laughs> the programs weren't working on it. So I had to, you know, delay that digital art class until another semester. And yeah. you know, so those are real issues that students face. They don't have the resources right. um, for whatever reasons. 
And so I always felt like I was a little bit behind, you know, mm-hmm. other folks, you know, when you have that um, kind of insecurity about, am I, you know, not as good as someone else, you know, but um, so I've always had that a little bit in the back of my mind, but it's just, you know, always a constant, you know, wanting to grow and you do over time, but it, it takes time. Yeah. So, you know, it just places a lot of importance on practicing and trying things that you've never done before. It's okay um, to, you know, take your time and continue studying. And that's what I tell my students. That's what we do as adults. We're always growing and learning. And so, um, yeah, I was really excited to do uh, a digital project I haven't touched on in a while. (laughs) Well, I'm glad you did it. I think it's a wonderful addition to Post Street. And um, I'm glad you're able to show us those three slides where you you kind of showed your mood board, but also um, spelled out the symbol, the, the symbols that you chose. Um, I I already, because I know her, I already kind of figured what you were sharing, but mm-hmm. I think it's great for our, um, our listeners and our viewers to hear that because when they go and see it or when they see it online, they'll know, um, oh, that's what she means. And, mm-hmm. and then maybe it'll encourage them to, to look up the foundation and look up the, because mm-hmm. not just to apply for a grant, but learn about the arts programs that they don't know about that, that Castiano Family Foundation are supporting. So yeah, I, I'm so glad that we had this conversation and um, we're gonna come back. So um, I'm gonna stop us here and just say thank you and uh, stick around. We're gonna meet with the other two, uh, two artists at the end, but. Thank you, Sophia, for for being open and sharing your your story about Carmen and the artwork you created. I think it's wonderful. Thank you so much, Amanda. Please stick around to listen to our next artist. Welcome back everyone. Uh, We had a great short conversation with Sophia and now I'm excited to introduce our next artist, Suki Bryan, who is a painter, printmaker and installation artist who creates environmental work that celebrates and explores the cycles and elements of nature. Her enormous outdoor pop-up installations have been commissioned by Stanford University, Palo Alto Art Center, the Brower Environmental Center and St. Bart's Church, New York, among others. Brian graduated from Yale College with a BA and MFA from the Maryland Institute of Art, and she lives and works in Stanford, California. Welcome, Suki. We're excited to see your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. So, so I when I saw the list of um, potential artists, uh, potential people to honor, uh, I was struck by the fact that there were a couple of dancers, and I had been a really serious dancer as a child, and up through kind of halfway through high school. So I thought it would be really wonderful to pursue um, looking at someone who had taken that path um, in such an amazing way. Ended up uh, being assigned Susan uh, V. Cashian. And when I started doing research on her, it turned out that um, there's just this overflowing um, emotion of um, warmth and, and appreciation for her kind of within this whole area. Um, she was a professor at Stanford in the dance department for over 30 years, um, and was a real, uh, force, um, in, um, ethnic dance in this area. Um, she was born in Pasadena and in college got exposed to Mexican dance and was completely smitten and ended up, um, having this amazing academic career and also artistic career where she got um, not one, but two um, Fulbright fellowships, one to go to Mexico and one to go um, to Chile, uh, and two masters, um, one in dance anthropology and one in um, just dance and uh, PhD in education from Stanford. So, and ended up sort of uh, studying and preserving and doing a lot of choreography, in Me- especially in Mexican dance um, idioms and made it this um, serious academic uh, field for people to study and also ended up being the creator, the founder of a number of dance companies that still exist 
um, with her partner, Ramon Morones, um, Lolus Peños uh, de San Jose, and then also the um, Ballet Folklorico um, de Stanford. Um, and uh, uh, there's a school associated with Los Peños and um, a cultural foundation. And so it just is an incredible like um, legacy that she's created um, in, in her passion for Mexican and Caribbean and Latin American dance. Um, and what became clear was like that just how warm she was as a person and how she um, was generous and enthusiastic and, and full of gratitude and um, had such a big impact on so many people. Um, so this is my studio at the time. So I, I pretty quickly decided that I wanted to do something with the um, skirt shape. I mean, obviously the feet would be really fantastic to be able to capture the movement. Um, but the skirt was a way to show kind of the um, movement and, and enthusiasm and also like definitely the um, cultural kind of connection. Um, so on the wall, you can see kind of the beginning of the skirt shape. I also decided to kind of riff on this famous poster that you can see on the floor in the left-hand corner of this shot. Um, it's a poster of Bob Dylan by um, Martin Glazer, who's one of the most famous American poster designers, uh, just graphic designers. And this poster um, came in a cover of Bob Dylan, and I thought it would be um, fun to kind of mimic the white and colored stripes that uh, Glazer put in Bob Dylan's hair. And the real reason why I thought this would be interesting is that they're kind of, um, uh, Susan Cashin and Bob Dylan are about the same age, and they kind of came up in, in an era where there was a real zeitgeist of interest in folk Bob Dylan and Joan Baez and um, Pete Seeger interested in folk music. There's also a lot of interest in folk dance and folk arts of kinds. So I thought to kind of tie in that idea of how she fit into that um, really important um, artistic pushing that happened in those ways in the uh, 70s in particular. Um, and then I did a sketch of her uh, face. She uh, um, died in 2013. So unfortunately it's kind of working not from life, but from photographs. And I decided to do a, a sketch with charcoal, um, the sort of midlife um, of her dancing. Um, and I used a bunch of different images to try and sort of get across, um, a, you know, semblance of her face. Um, and then the thing that I added the last was I had made, um, a collage, a paper collage of a whole lot of skirts um, and put that in the background. So here's the final piece. Um, and that was, I, was meant to sort of represent um, the way that she disseminated so much of her knowledge and um, uh, performance experience and technical experience and also um, academic um, knowledge to all of her students at Stanford and in San Jose and everywhere. And a lot of her students have apparently gone on and founded dance um, companies of their own or been involved in supporting the arts. Um, so this was a way to try and show this, um, this impact that she had and spreading of the importance of dance um, as really a part of life. Um, she talked about, apparently, I read in a quote, um, her student says, uh, her family, mi familia. Um, and that, so that was sort of that idea in the background. Um, and uh, it was really a pleasure to learn about her. I live on the Stanford campus. Um, and it was just wonderful to sort of have that connection as well, to think about this person having this huge impact on generations of students um, and really introducing students to uh, a culture and the importance of dance um, and the joy that can be had from dance um, for people that, for whom the culture is familiar, but also to people that are from all over the world. So um, it was really, uh, 
an honor to make this piece um, for as in a, in, in a way to honor uh, Susan Cashin. Wow, thank you, Suki. I um, I had to like take a breath there because um, you know when when we when you were when you first came on and you were working on this, I know there was a lot of like uh, how how should I move forward creating this work and. Um, uh, uh, you had a different, um, you had a different approach, which you showed that first image, right? Yeah. And you, um, you kind of uh, dug a little deeper, it feels like. Um, and yeah, would you want to speak on that? Yeah, I wasn't sure what was wanted in a way, I think at first. And I think that for this piece in general, that the tricky thing is that um, since there are women that are not like really well known, it's not like Abraham Lincoln or something, <laughs> how much how much education should be in the piece and how much, and that's, I, so those sort of issues I think are really interesting and hard to figure out. But yeah. um, so, and to say like, well, somebody can go back and like, you know, study it. It's like, no, you want, you want to somehow give something that at least gives the idea of the person, um, right. what they're about. So it was a, um, a, a challenge. So. <laughs> yeah. Plus, you know, so, I'm sorry, you, I, I cut you off there. Okay. You say? Um, <laughs> I say deeper because I um, I've walked by your piece a number of times, your artwork a number of times on post on on post street, and have talked about it, have given tours since the artwork has gone up, and um, it I I feel like I'm able to see, seeing it here on the screen. I, I'm able to see things I'm not able to see on the banner, and so I'm mm -hmm. glad we're having this conversation because. Um, I this like warm feeling uh, ha came up for me when you spoke about the layers of the collage of the skirts in the background of Susan. And when you brought up the image, that last image, it's almost like she blends in. Like there's this kind of you don't know where one starts or where one begin or uh, one ends, and that just I, warm feeling. I mean, I said it already, right? It, it, and the way that you described her. Um, the uh, her her herself as a, as a person as this woman is so kind and generous and I only know of her I never got a chance to meet her but I knew people who who dance for Los Lupeños and um and she created this sense of community right, right. and and like you said one of the quotes that it, she identifies our um she she has said about her students is mi familia and that all just it represents what you cr created um. So I, I, I just wanted to speak on that because it, yeah, I don't know. It made me a little speechless and almost made me want to cry because she, she hasn't been gone that long, you know? And That's um, yeah. Yeah. When I um, sent, I decided to send emails to the Stanford dance department um, and I was shocked at how quickly I heard back and just the overwhelming, like, Oh, I'm so glad you're doing this and the warmth because Stanford, you know, they're, Senior professors are busy, like you don't, yeah. don't like just don't necessarily expect a response on the dime. So it was really, it really struck me like, wow, this person was special. So I'm glad and, you brought that up because I wanted to ask you about that, about how that, um, how you made that connection, and it, did anybody remember her, and was there anyone specifically okay. you spoke to on campus? So yeah, a bunch of different faculty members, actually some of the people in the theater department too because I think she was very generous with what she did. I mean, the one person said, oh, she didn't just love dance. She loved all the arts and she participated and did stuff with theater and lighting, you know, so I think she was, wow. you know, just, yeah. The thing that was fun for me about the skirts was that um, it turned out a little bit psychedelic, which I kind of liked <laughs> again for the 1970s and stuff. So, because she was yeah. in college in the 60s in UCLA. Yeah. I mean, it had to yeah. be a little psychedelic down yeah. there. And then so, she came to Stanford, right? Where, um, right. what is yep. that? The book, the the uh, psychedelic, uh, the Tom Wolf. Oh yeah, I'm mm -hmm. going a little deeper now, but yeah, <laughs> but, yeah, that world, right? And I actually pulled up the poster that you shared in your studio because I wanted to look at it a little closer, and um, that silhouette or the. Um, yeah, the, the silhouette of Bob Dylan, and you know it's him with the nose and everything, and yeah. um, the profile, and but that the lines, right? It's very telling of that generation, um, mm -hmm. but it's also very telling of like the movement, the constant movement of those dresses. I mean, those 
those dresses are those skirts are gorgeous in any color I, um, and the movement. I mean, actually, I learned the term skirt work, which I think is like a great term for that <laughs> kind of dance movement. It's extraordinary. Yeah. I mean, it's just amazing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So. Yeah. I absolutely then, I agree. Uh, uh, it was a nice motif to be able to work with that in, ter in terms of movement because, you know, oh. in a still image, it can be hard to kind of express you know, a dance move or whatever. So that was yeah. Fun. Why why did you choose the color yellow? I don't think you you spoke on that. Well, um, you know, I I didn't speak on it because I probably couldn't say anything in particular. I don't know. It just struck me as a nice, vibrant color to use. Ah, I did okay. with a number of them. It was just the one that I liked that just sung the most to me so yeah yeah and, and so did you know that she was somebody who um was on part of the stanford campus before you picked her or did you, i mean you you mentioned that she gravitated toward her because she was a dancer right and that was what something that yeah. you that's part of your history right and i actually did, did ballet and jazz so i thought i might end up with a ballet person but i'm glad i didn't it was really much more fun to be exposed to somebody in a different dance field and then someone who did so much. I mean, one of the things that I thought was so interesting is that um, what she was such a scholar, like she studied it so much and from an anthropological point of view. And then apparently she um, took dances that were really for church settings or other kind of social settings and, and re choreographed them to be in a performance mode so they could be shared. And, and that's just really super interesting, I think. Yeah, I mean, I I was when I was doing uh, research on her, I remember reading the Fulbright fellowships. And oh. for those who don't know about Fulbright, I mean, and those who do, you know that that is not an easy. Just getting the first one is not an easy thing to do, and she got yeah. two. Well, um, then he, like I I knew she had a master's and PhD, but no, she had two masters. <laughs> like it's really it's really amazing, right? And these are the stories you know, that we. We, we have to share, right? I mean, this is something that I was speaking in the earlier conversation about is we, these women who have done these incredible things for our community, for when I say our, I mean the Santa Clara County, right? Um, the young people are just people, whether they're young or not, who don't know about these women, these individuals um, can be inspired by them. You know, I mean, her just hearing about her education in anthropology, arts anthropology, that's, that's just, I never, I never heard about that before as, yeah. as an art historian. I've never, that's never been something that has come to my attention. And I can only imagine what that can do for somebody who's trying to figure out what their next step is. Right. Mm -hmm. That's why it's important to tell these stories, to encourage the, this, the secession, who's the next and then the next, right. That full circle. Um, so yeah. I'm glad you shared that. Just to have someone who's shows like art is, important and it's also complicated like you need to you could study it like it's really valuable and it's you know as intricate and important and complex uh right field as anything else yeah and you know i think the other story the other thing we can take from this of what uh, about recognizing um susan cashin um is that she, I don't believe she was Chicana. She was not Latina. She, she, you know, she, she learned about this culture that she respected and was fascinated with and, and took it and just went with it. Right. And became respected and accepted. And I think that also shows, um, uh, represents how we should move forward, right. About sharing any cultures and being open-minded and uh, making it accessible and, um, and, and being there to, to teach, to teach others as well. Right. right. Um, so I didn't know, like I didn't read anywhere that she, she that she was Mexican American. And I, yeah. I just not to ask, cause I kept saying, why should it matter? Why do I need to right. know? Yeah. Why do I would it, if it was one way or the other, like, would it change what I do? And, and if it did change it, should it? So I decided right. to like, just put blinders on and just not know. I'm so glad you did that. You know, I, I bring it up because, um, uh, just, you know, I, I, I'm Mexican. I've never done full critical dancing. I've always been amazed by it. And I'm sure there's so many other, uh, Latinas out there like me who have been just, uh, in awe watching, 
the dancers and just haven't haven't didn't do it or didn't feel connected or I don't know whatever reason the individual has but the point is is that you can be of any background and still be able to embed yourself into these cultures as long as you show this respect and this this right. sense of community and connection and and be kind right and so yeah. I think it's a wonderful story to that we're able to share I'm glad you picked it because it worked out really really well I love sharing that experience and getting able being able to hear that um you have not just one connection to her story as a young dancer but you both work at work at stan or you know you're both at stanford like <laughs> yeah. i think that's pretty cool it's another it's, it's another nice. artist who finds that full circle and also, like a, a professor who because her professors you know they're they're all amazing my neighbors i mean it's i feel so lucky to live here um and a lot of them reach outside into the world and make a big impact. But I love that she made a big impact at Stanford and all the generations of students that came through, but also like this community, San Jose, and not all the um, professors are able to do that or think to do it or whatever. So that's really, really wonderful. I agree. I agree. I'm glad you said that because that is something we don't always see. It, it, we do it, we do see the, the impact trying to be spread internationally. And she really mm -hmm. focused locally. And I think, yeah, that's key. So thank you so much, Suki. Um, this was a great conversation. I can keep talking to you about her, but we need to move on. <laughs> we're going to we're going to uh, work with the next artist and, and listen from our listen to her story. And as I said, um, we're gonna come back later and we're going to have a conversation with all three artists. So please stick around and um, stick around to take a listen to our last artist. Welcome back everyone. We had a chance to listen to two really amazing artists and now we will be speaking and hearing from our last artist before we group together. So Melia Saito is a Chinese and Japanese American mixed media artist and cinematographer from San Jose, California. Whether behind a camera or in front of a blank wall, Melia often uses art as a channel for reflection and introspection. Through her work, she explores the celebration of identity, cultural memories, and the intimacy of shared experiences. Outside of her creative practices, she's an avid solo traveler, live music geek, and a fledgling endurance athlete, which I think is awesome. So welcome, Melia. I'm excited to hear your presentation and have a conversation with you afterwards. I'll let you take it. Thank you, Amanda. Um, hi, my name is Melia Saito, and I had the honor of being a part of the Downtown San Jose Artist Residency, um, participating in the Womanhood Project, um, and I had the honor of um, commemorating LGBTQ leader and activist Gabrielle Antolovich. Um, and Gabrielle um, grew up in Sydney, um, and um, her lifelong work has been in activism from the anti-war movement, um, the women's liberation movement, LGBTQ movement, um, anti or Aboriginal land rights movement. Um, and coming to the US, um, Gabrielle got involved with um, Voices United, a nonprofit, and as well as uh, substance use prevention um, for young people. And currently Gabrielle is the president of the Billy DeFrank Center um, and we personally know each other um, through uh, an LGBTQ uh, documentary program called Documentary Documenter Me. Um, we met in 2020, um, and I'll talk about more of that experience um, later in my presentation. Um, before uh, this project, uh, I'm really excited uh, to be able to honor Gabrielle um, through this banner design that's uh, found. Um, for, on Post Street in front of the Hammer Theater, or I'm uh, sorry, Paseo de San Antonio. Um, Paseo de San Antonio in front of the Hammer Theater. Um, let's see. Um, about, a little bit about my artistic background. Um, I would say mostly I work in digital mediums. Um, I created my banner in the, the iPad program Procreate. Um, but when it comes to portraits, um, I've, I've 
pretty much most of the portraits I've done in the past uh, have been through analog mediums. So um, color pencils, uh, pastels, charcoal. So I don't really work much um, in digital when it comes to portraits. And uh, my portrait work um, comes a lot from like my younger years practicing art. Um, so in high school, um, taking like my high school uh, like art class, uh, did a lot of portraits um, there and always in analog mediums. Um, portraits, I, I love doing portraits, but I haven't done it in a while. And so when I was working on my banner, um, I realized like, wow, I'm, I'm kind of rusty at this, uh, but that was a really fun challenge. And um, from the sketches um, that you see on the right-hand side, um, these were some of my early portrait sketches as I was trying to figure out um, how I wanted to go about rendering Gabrielle's face, um, what colors I wanted to use, what kind of style I wanted to use. And when it came down to it, um, I wanted to go back to my roots and work um, work in a digital medium, but using an, a style that replicates um, an analog medium. So I used um, uh, a pencil type brush tip in Procreate uh, to create these pencil-like strokes. And once I started doing that, I felt a lot more comfortable uh, working in this medium, in this style. And I, I feel like that's when I started getting this like flow state going. And so um, on the, the process images on the right-hand side, the top one, that's when I was, um, I was playing around with more like digital painting uh, style techniques in Procreate. And I, I really wasn't feeling that. And um, that, that uh, technique is what I've used in previous, uh, more like recent previous works. Um, for example, in recent mural works, I'll work digitally at first and then translate the digital sketch into an analog medium like paint on a wall. Um, and so when I sketch out my designs for mural works, I, I use like a digital painting kind of style in Procreate. And so for this project, um, I went with a more rough kind of, um, um, I guess, like uh, scrappy <laughs> style. I, I, I call my art style scrappy in general, uh, but just, yeah, replicating that analog uh, style. And um, so from the bottom, the bottom process sketch on the right side, that's when I started um, getting more comfortable rendering Gabrielle's face. Um, and uh, this also shows a, a background that I was working with previously. Um, another fun challenge was designing a banner because this was the first time I was designing um, something of this medium, like a public art piece in the form of a banner. And so um, with that, the at first I originally wanted to incorporate a design where it covers Gabrielle's life work as um, an activist, um, lifelong work incorporating these images on the left side. These images um, were, these archival images of Gabrielle were taken from Gabrielle's film that uh, she made in the Documentary Me program that we did in 2020. Um, and uh, I, yeah, at first I wanted to do um, like sketches of Gabrielle, like younger Gabrielle um, throughout in the background of the banner. Um, but once, once I started trying those out, I realized that when you have a banner that's out in the city, um, you know, people are going to be walking by. You, you have a really short time frame of, of how to like capture someone's attention and convey information visually. And so um, as I was playing with layouts, I realized, um, you know, I, I wanted to try something a little more simple and a little more direct, um, working with the medium and just the, the real estate that I had in the banner. And so uh, I decided to use the archway of the Billy DeFrank Center. And as I was doing um, research of Gabrielle, um, I found inspiration from um, this piece that was done by Suhita Sketch um, for Faces of Recovery uh, with a Recovery Cafe. And in that, um, there was a quote by Gabrielle saying that I have brightly colored lights up on the porch at the center now. I want everyone to see um, what we are doing and we are doing all we can um, to keep our community safe. And um, I was really struck by that as, uh, as well as this quote that was in Gabrielle's uh, film that um, states, I don't belong anywhere, but I am determined to be comfortable everywhere. 
Um, so I incorporating this archway, this iconic rainbow archway of the Billy to Frank Center and um, the rows of lights um, lit up. I really wanted that. I really wanted that to illustrate this feeling of safety and welcoming and acceptance for all. Um, and as well as Gabrielle's just facade, like I really wanted to capture that just Gabrielle's zest and spirit. Um, that was probably the first thing that um, captivated me when we met um, in this documentary program. And so, you know, this um, we met in the fall of 2020 um, through this program uh, through Create TV. And um, yeah, I would see Gabrielle in this uh, in the Zoom screen because this was during the pandemic in this like little rect rectangle. And um, as you can see in the this like mood board image of screen caps, that's Gabrielle in her office in the Billy DeFrank Center. And Gabrielle will just be surrounded by these uh, boas and pride flags and. Um, and also just like, just having this spirit that was just kind of like, like transcend beyond this little zoom rectangle. And so I really wanted to capture that liveliness um, in this design. And um, just from our experience being together in this program, um, I really, I really admired the stories that Gabrielle would share, um, even though we are a decades apart in age, like I feel this a sense of like intergenerational connection and also just um, hearing Gabrielle's stories of being a child of immigrants. Um, Gabrielle is, um, Gabrielle's parents came from Yugoslavia and just talking about the experiences and expectations um, of being a child of immigrants, especially with like a queer identity being out. Um, I was able to draw a lot of parallels with just um, having that experiences, even though, um, like we come from different generations. Uh, there's just such an importance um, in capturing these stories um, throughout generations um, because there's a lot of there's a lot of similarities um, that we could share. And um, and you know, I'm just very proud to be able to honor Gabrielle through the Womanhood Project. Um, and Every time I see the banner uh, in front of the Hammer Theater, it's it's always a surreal feeling. So I'm really grateful for this opportunity with the Womanhood Project. Um, it's given me such a such a like special opportunity to reflect on um, just the way that we capture history, stories, um, and people, and just this legacy, this overall legacy of um, individuals that make up this wider tapestry of. San Jose and its stories. Um, oh yeah, thank you. Thank you, that was great. I'm so glad you shared that with us. Um, first of all, I wanna say that uh, your banner definitely is like a light up. I mean, we, we've just got, I, I feel like we had, we've been working with amazing artists for this project and you all are so unique and different and fantastic in your own ways. And I, I love this banner, it's very colorful. It's, it's eye catching, absolutely. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I did a, I toured uh, the artwork with some people and um, you're, with one of the tours I did, your work, somebody said, oh my goodness, that's Gabrielle and that's totally her. Like they, they just, they, they, first of all, they knew her, but the colors and the, the active, the movement in it, you know what I mean? With the lines that you use, the colors and the line movement that you use for her face and um, the colors of uh, just kind of like this. I, I think of it as a walkway, a pathway to her, right? Or she's walking to you. Um, they, it just spoke to them. Like this is her. That, that's all that this woman, this woman said. She's like, this is this is Gabrielle. Like I don't. It's like she could jump out of that, and she would be this really energetic person. I'm like, yes, that's. <laughs> I think that's what the artist was going for. Which clearly, you know, you said it. You captured her zest and spirit. Um, and I've always seen her around. So I'm, I'm so glad that, um, you chose her, Melia, because I, I, did, I didn't know Gabrielle's story. So I just knew that this was a person that was really connected, uh, to the LGBTQ, um, community here in our county, um, would see Gabrielle at, at events, but never had a chance to actually speak, uh, one-on-one. -on -one. So, um, I just, I wanted to ask you, um, it, it sounds like she's kind of she you have this connection obviously um almost like a um mentor mentee so 
um, could you go a little deeper deeper about um, how and why you connected with, Gab with Gabrielle? I know you spoke about the d documentary. Uh, what was the program documentary? documentary. I heard. Of, yeah, yeah I I I I know of it. I just did. She already was she already part of it, or did you choose her for that? And then obviously she was on our list of individuals that you can pick from, and I'm sure you saw that and thought, oh, I got to grab her right away. <laughs> Yeah, so um, this was in fall of 2020, and um, we were a cohort um, th for this program. I think it was the the second year Creative TV was doing the documentary documentary me program, mm -hmm. and so this year's co or that year's cohort was like a specifically like uh, individuals of um, LGBTQ plus identity oh. um, from S Santa Clara County. Um, and so me and Gabrielle were one of the uh, six, six <laughs> um, the six uh, participants um, from the program. And um, I loved that the the program had a very diverse um, pool of individuals um, from ages to career backgrounds um, to experiences with working um, in this like film medium. And so I was, I felt like we were all able to learn from each other. Um, there was no like, like, like hierarchy of like, who knew what, yeah. or like, who was, who was like, I don't know, more, um, I don't know, like, I, like, yeah, I just, did, I, I, like, we were just all in the same playing field. And yeah. um, just like in the beginning of our program in the first couple sessions, we had a lot of discussions about um, like what does LGBTQ representation look like in film? Like what could be done better? What do we need more of? What do we need less of? Um, like how do we, what does pride look like? Um, mm -hmm. What, mm -hmm. how do we showcase the multifaceted, multifacetedness of like the queer identity? Um, and I, I just loved, um, the stories that Gabrielle shared. Um, and and just, I feel like even though we have very different um, just experiences generationally and also just like with growing up, um, the differences in just how, um, how far like LGBTQ rights and visibility has come um, compared to like when I was growing up um, and like when Gabrielle was growing up, I feel like yeah. I'm able to enjoy or just um, experience a lot more like comfortability um, or just mm -hmm. like like peace um, or just like resources um, regarding like my queer identity um, because mm -hmm. of the work that Gabrielle um, and that generation like throughout right. um, the decades have worked towards um, and like even though we are, there's, you know, um, many years that separate us, like there's, we're still part of this overall legacy. Like um, the film that Gabrielle created, um, it was called A Tribute to Young Queer Activists. Um, I could really see Gabrielle's uh, passion in um, like stewarding the, the next generation. And um, it goes back to like, you know, there's no hierarchy, there's no like, um, ego when it comes to like, oh, you know, like I've done this for so many years or, um, you know, it's just like, we're all working towards this yes. future together. And, yeah. um, and, you know, like we, by sharing our stories and by, um, like paving the way for the next generation, um, that's how we're going to keep this movement going. And so I really appreciate it. Uh, just Gabrielle's passion for, um, younger generations and just the people that um, she has worked with throughout the decades through her life's work. Um, yeah. And yeah, when I saw her name in the in the deck, I knew that like that was someone that I had to pick because the the, the people that I I like listed in my uh, selection, um, the the common denominator was like a connection via identity, whether that was like um, cultural identity or mm -hmm. like queer identity. And so, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I was really happy that uh, I was selected to honor Gabrielle. Uh, I love that. I really do. I, and I love that you um, 
you recognize that we can have, we as a, humans, as, as individuals can have these um, friendships with people who are not of our same age or age group, right? Age grouping. Um, and I think it's incredibly important to develop those type of relationships and friendships that are intergener are generation different generations. Um, we're constantly learning from each other, right? And it sounds like that's what was going on with yourself and Gabrielle. And and you said it. You know, you uh, what what she did as an activist, as a as a young activist, um, both in Australia and here in uh, the United States, and not just for. Um, not just for LGBTQ rights, but also for um, Aboriginal, you know, like, I mean, and for youth. And I mean, this is, this is like this incredible person um, who probably, I think I remember her, somebody saying she was like, why am I being, why am I being recognized? <laughs> uh, like, what do you mean? You, you, know, you have been a, there for community. I wrote down the quote that you said, I don't belong anywhere, but I am determined to be comfortable everywhere. I mean, if that it was something that was shared uh, before social media in a very um, in different com in different conversations, particularly in LGBTQ uh, communities, I can only assume how many people would have connected to that. And you know what I mean? And and um, I, I just. And as somebody who doesn't identify as that, um, I can only, I'm only basing it off of stories that I've learned and histories I've read about and friends I know who've experienced the, um, uh, 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 frustrating situations is probably the best way to put it. Um, that's why these stories are important to share, right? Uh, because I think even though we're living in a community where um, there are freedoms, there still might be uh, internal insecurities that people are trying to figure out. And when they learn and, and have the opportunity to see images like Gabrielle and others like her, um, it's, it's almost like this door is being open, right? And then learning that you can be friends with somebody who is 50 years older than you. You know what I mean? Like, and isn't going to judge you and isn't going to say... Uh, uh, isn't going to be an, an ageist about it, right? I mean, there's such there's a beauty about having generational friendships and being able to um, tell the stories um, that that we don't want to have, um, uh, to, we don't want to get lost. I mean, you just showed the images of her when she was really young, and it is fantastic to be able to see those images because who knows if we didn't have these projects such as womanhood or not, like the documentary program you did, would we have known about her, right? So I think that's why it's incredibly important to be able to, to do things like this and provide space for artists like yourself to come back and I even wrote this down, like it was, you had a chance to go back to the medium that you knew growing up, but using it in, in the medium that you work with now. And that too is like this great kind of, um, uh, uh, connection to what you you love uh, and showing people who are going to be watching this and listening into this that are artists or trying to figure out how do I connect these two to continue telling stories that it's possible, right? So I, I thank you for sharing that. I think that was really fantastic. And um, yeah, I, I when I read about Gabriel's background and and history, I was just first of all, she probably doesn't. She to me, I can't even think of her being old enough to have done all of that because she looks young and maybe it's because she's very like spunky and you know and just I mean you we, we saw that image of her your portrait of her looks exactly like her and it's with the hair and the vibrancy and the colors and the and the star scarf uh, <laughs> um I just it's it's crazy to think that you know she's she's done so much and still is doing so thank you for sharing your mentor with us um, is the person that you've been able to work with and learn from and probably you're still connected with moving forward. I think it's just been incredible to learn. Um, and it was great that you both were able to be at the kickoff for this project. Yeah. So 
Thank you uh, so much. We're going to actually have a conversation with yourself and the two other artists that we um, already had a chance to listen to. And I have some new questions for all of you. Uh, I just want to uh, take this time to uh, yes, you hear our artists. We're going to we're going to take a quick break and we will be right back um, and we'll have a short conversation. Welcome back, everyone. I am super excited to have all the artists in this uh, quick co conversation before we close out uh, this um, today's uh, today's longer conversation. So, um, welcome, Melia, Sophia, and Suki. Um, super glad to have the three of you here, and thank you for sharing all of your experiences with me and and the people that are um, watching in. I wanted to. I don't know if any of you noticed this because you all had a chance to watch um, while you were sharing. But um, you all are, have, are connected to your honoree in some way. Like, <laughs> um, whether you work with them personally or you have something similar or um, they've influenced you in other ways, I had something that I noticed um, right away. And I, I just wanted to bring that up. I almost said it in the last conversation, but I wanted to bring it up while you all were on here. So um, I thought that was really cool because you know, some of our artists who um, are celebrating uh, the women they, they pick, they, they didn't know anything about them or they are really connected to them in other ways. You know what I mean? This one just happened to be similar. This group happened to be similar in this way and I think it's fantastic. So <laughs> I don't know if you noticed that, but mm -hmm. um, thank you. Um, so I have a few questions for you. We're gonna, we're gonna kind of move around quickly. And um, one of them is, um, when you think about the woman that you chose to honor um, and, and why, um, what was, and some of you spoke about this, so maybe this is an opportunity to speak about this a little bit more. Um, any of the research you did to, did it inform your design? You know, I know that um, you spoke on this, but I wanted to give the opportunity to share uh, anything you, you maybe forgot while you were having the conversation with me and doing the presentation. Um, if not, if you want to speak a little bit more on what you shared, that would also be nice to hear. Me, Anybody, Suki. whoever wants to go first. <laughs> go ahead, Sugi. Um, uh, I'm blanking out. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, if I could go back to the thing you said before, though, um, I think that having a link to the person made it um, a really wonderful kind of jumping off point. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, it's like, I would recommend it in the future, like in your choosing that it's nice to have that connection. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cause you are trying to pack so much in there. And if you have, can have sort of an emotional content that you bring along to the project, that's, that supports like any other kind of design, intellectual content or whatever. So, right. yeah, and and to follow up, I didn't personally know Carmen Castellano, but you know, she I knew of her and and her husband and the impact they had made. Um, I think I went to a play at San Jose City, and they were there at, at opening night, you know, and so I always knew, you know, of them and their presence was huge, mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's amazing how all of us, yeah, have this connection. And it really, I think, did impact our design and, and how beautiful they came out. You know, we wanted to make them, you know, as large as they were in real life. Yeah. In this, in this compact, you know, uh, yeah. I mean, Melia, you talked about that a little bit, right? I mean, the, here is this small space of a banner and you have to figure out a way to, to share all the things that, that Gabrielle did, but you ended up figuring out doing it a, a different way, which still really speaks to who she is. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I feel like this project and the, the, the women that were honored, I, I see this, just this connection, this overall connection, not just like by via the artists and the women, but also just um, in this 
overall ecosystem of San Jose's art and culture. Um, like uh, Carmen Castellano, um, I, I've worked at a, a ceremony that was honoring um, her contributions and um, for the foundation um, at the Mexican Heritage Plaza, which I work at, and which also um, uh, hosts uh, Los Lupeños, um, which is founded by uh, um, Suki's Susan. pottery. And yeah. Um, yeah, there's just like all these overlapping connections. And I know Gabrielle through Create TV, um, which is uh, like, uh, like a well-known community partner in, in San yeah. Jose. And so there's all these like overlapping connections and it it just like overall makes me really grateful to be part of um, like the San Jose, the San Jose community, the San Jose arts community. Um, and I, I feel like it really showcases the the vibrancy um, and the the connections that exist within um, our community. Yeah, I agree with you. I, I think that, um... You know, this project was specific to to women who contributed to San Jose, but these three women contributed to the county. I mean, they did to San Jose, but they they contributed to the, they are or they had they did um, contribute to the county overall. You know, and I think that's something also that is very powerful about the women that the three of you um, did decide to choose to recognize. Uh, and um, when I think our first episode. Um, we spoke to artist uh, Dana Harris Seeker, and she had, had the opportunity to recognize women who are from the turn of the 20th century. You know, there's <laughs> there's no the connection there was very different. So hearing this is it's a great way to see the to understand and learn how women have made an impact, um, you know, in our county that are closer, more contemporary, right? Um, which I think is uh, fantastic. And I totally forgot that you work at the Mexican Heritage Plaza, Lillian, because that's where, <laughs> yeah, Carmen and Al would be. And then of course, that's where Los Supenios performs. So <laughs> that's pretty, that's pretty great. Um, you know, this is, this is a research project. Maybe some of you hadn't, haven't done anything like this before. You have, what, um, what advice would you give to artists who would participate in projects like this or, um, you know, we want to continue, as I said at the beginning, and as I introduced this uh, session, uh, we want to continue this type of temporary public art moving forward in the county and other, other cities in our county. So um, maybe not exactly the same, but similar in the sense of recognizing an individual. What, what advice would you give that you learned or um, that you wish you knew? I think you shared something already, Suki. So that's, <laughs> yeah. I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to add to that. You caught me. You, <laughs> you already knew. <laughs> um, yeah, I think if, I mean, I was lucky because there was so much material on Susan Cashin. So that was great. I could have like kept reading forever. There was tons of articles um, and even her own writing. And there was like a it, um, Encyclopedia Britannica piece that she had written so I could yeah. read that so there was that was really nice so I could really get a sense of like her mind kind of and her interest in her scope um, um, less a little less about personal life which is fine because this is about what she did um, so I mean I, that's the only thing if you can find it I think that's really helpful um, to, to give because then you can you just have a richness of um, things to draw from so yeah Sophia, Melia? Um, if, you know, this is the first time that I've done uh, public artwork like this, um, for someone who this may be their first time, I would say go for it. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you are being super supported by the Womanhood Project organization um, who are there to help and, you know, go for it, try something new, and you probably will be pleasantly surprised in your her work. I love that. I really do. Melia, did you want to add? Yeah, um, I, I'm, I'm thinking about Sophia, what you said earlier, um, in your talk about how, you know, this, like being an artist, you know, sometimes there's that doubt of like, um, oh, I'm like behind, or, you know, there's so much that I don't know yet. 
um, you, you know, am I, am I there yet? And, um, and I, and I feel like, you know, every artist kind of goes through these thoughts, um, especially like when, for me, like when I'm making the piece, when I'm creating it and I get stuck, um, uh, like when I, I, I felt like my original idea with, um, the background of the banner was not working out, you know, I get stuck and, um, and yeah, so I, I, one, I really want to encourage artists to, um, believe in yourself, like you, you can do this, like you are an artist, um, this, the, the opportunities you get are all just part of this overall, um, uh, like a legacy of experiences that you will, um, you will get that will further your career and help you learn along the way and also show mm -hmm. that, um, you know, it, you are worthy of taking up space, um, like especially artists mm -hmm. from marginalized backgrounds, um, you deserve to take up space. Um, and especially in the world of public arts, like it's so empowering when you see your piece out there, like in the public, big and, you know, as part mm -hmm. of the city, um, it's it's such an overwhelmingly and powerful experience. Um, and so, so yeah, I really encourage artists. Um, yeah, like don't like persevere through your doubts, um, trust the process. And, um, you know, it's okay if you totally uh, steer off your original plan, like you will get there. And, um, and yeah, and you, like Sophia said, like sometimes you'll be surprised in what you'll end up creating. Um, yeah. yeah. If I can add um, another feeling I have in both of Sophia and Mylea, both of your pieces really do this a lot is I love the way that you guys came up with motifs you know, kind of early and like just kept working them, um, you know, with the paper cutting and the symbols and um, your background, my Leah. And um, I think that's a really good way to like think about trying to pack information into these kind of projects where there's, there just isn't much room and it has to be fast, like you said, my Leah. Um, but I think that to, if you can come up with um, some visual, icons or visual elements that you're going to then just like play with, play with, play with until you can get them in a way that you're happy that will help express your ideas about the person, that that can be super effective as it is in your banners. Yeah, I think in, in, in all of yours, I think, um, especially now getting a chance to uh, to speak with each of you and, and kind of hear your process and your uh, your connection to the honorees that you, you chose. Um, yeah, I, I think, you know, the other thing we thought about when we were putting this together was you know, there's 13 artists, as I mentioned, and the really great thing, I mean, we're seeing it right here, artists who have been doing this for years, artists who are newer to it, artists who um, see themselves in different lights or maybe never done anything like this, this specifically before, y'all are getting a chance to, and the opportunity to not only learn about women who are doing incredible things, but also meet other women who, and introduce yourselves to uh, to each other who are also doing incredible things. I want you to remember that and, and take that forward because there's gonna be other women who are gonna be meeting or, or, or not realizing that um, uh, you know, they they are just as great right? um, until they actually do it. So I, I just wanted to, to say that out loud now before I forget. So, um, so I appreciate you, uh, you all, all of you, and for sharing and spending your time with, with us this evening. I, I just had um, one last question. Uh, are there any other women that uh, you would um, nominate to be honored and, uh, or any groups of women and, um, and, and that you would like to see represented in this project that we, don't, we haven't talked about? That's my last question for you. So think about that one for a second. <laughs> um, I, for me, the thing I wonder about is if uh, a next group of women to, would be women in tech, you know, just because men dominate so much. And yet there are these women like, um, and this is not my field, but I do know there's like Joanna Hoffman from Apple mm -hmm. um, and Diane Green who founded VMware um, so that, I mean, I think that would be interesting. Um, or the other person I thought of was an economist, Anat Admati, who, um, studies financial markets. And during the last big recession with the, um, she was really influential in trying to get banking rules changed with not as much as wow. she would like. 
But there's a quote that um, I saw that um, when she talks, banks shudder, which just seems like well, that's <laughs> she should be on a banner or something for sure. I <laughs> love that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it just seems like, like, I like that the, I mean, I don't know, the, I don't know what's more important, like somebody who runs a soup kitchen or somebody who runs, you know, they're all really important. Exactly. But in, in, a, in this area that's um, so dominated by tech, it would be, it'd be nice to have women. Thank you, Suki. That is definitely something we've heard. Of, we've heard. So we appreciate yeah. hearing it again. That's just pushing it even more. So we love it. Sophia, Milia, either of you want to go? Um, well, I've thought about this and I've wondered, um, you know, us hopefully coming out of this pandemic, a lot of community leaders have emerged or, you know, taken a lot more on their plate because of the pandemic and they've done so much, whether it's been, you know, disseminating information about COVID, um, helping, you know, with COVID testing, vaccines, um, donations um, for food and resources. Mm -hmm. Um, I wonder if we should also take a moment to honor those people, um, you know, who have been working super, super hard volunteering the last couple of years. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's a great idea. That is Even a great idea. County um, Health Commissioner Sus Sarah Cody. Yes, Dr. I don't Cody. Know she got through the amount of pressure and death threats and, you know, all this stuff and did such a good job keeping us as safe as possible. Yeah. I, love that. Yeah, I love that idea, Sophia. Yeah. yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, and um, there's so many groups that uh, to use their businesses as places to pick up food, right? Um, mm -hmm. To do the food boxes and distribution. I mean, that was huge, right? Yeah. That was for everybody and anybody. And there's yeah. still that are still going. There's still some that are still going on. So I think that's a great suggestion. Thank you, Melia. Yeah, um, a person that came to mind um, was someone that I was able to work uh, with in um, a previous public arts project, also on um, commemoration of history and um, individuals that have impacted San Jose, Japantown, and um, that was Susan Hayase, uh, and she um, she's a resident of San Jose. She um, she was part of the the redress movement for Japanese Americans um, in the 1980s. She helped recruit um, individuals to speak on um, behalf of their experiences. Um, and um, she co-founded, um, sorry, um, uh, sorry, her like repertoire is just like so long. Like she, she also yeah, has yeah. like a lifelong, uh, like a lifelong body of work um, that um has been all about um uh like preserving uh, san jose japan town um the stories of japanese americans um and the impact of the the incarceration during world mm -hmm. war ii um and as well as contributing to the arts and um culture uh, japanese uh, japanese american arts and culture um through taiko and mm. as well as current projects, um, uh, Nikkei Resistors, um, Hidden Histories of San Jose Japantown, um, and um, working with the Japanese American Museum of San Jose. Um, and she also she also is like an engineer, um, worked in tech. <laughs> uh, Sounds and so, amazing. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> uh, she was a person that came to mind um, as I uh, like after after we finished the projects and um, the question of like who else. Uh, should be honored. Uh, yeah, I was like, oh, Susan. <laughs> I love that. So I'm definitely going to reach out to you after this so we make sure we get her correct information. Thank you. <laughs> I think that's fantastic. I live in Japantown. So this is, I, that's somebody new. I am not, I don't know why I haven't heard about her before. So I really appreciate you, you bringing her up. So thank you, the three of you, for spending this evening with me and everybody who's watching. And um, you know, you all opened up and shared, and I really appreciate that. And I'm I'm glad that um, that you were a part of this project, and that I'm I'm hoping we continue to stay connected to you. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank you. As I said to the artists, Sophia, Suki, and Melia, for spending time with us today and sharing your experiences. 
it's been a great conversation. I hope all of you have enjoyed this conversation from each of the artists and, and um, learned something new. So uh, if you want to stay involved with the Womanhood Project, here are some ways you can participate. So join in on the Artists Honoring Women conversation every third Monday. We have a few left, so keep on coming back. Uh, check out the project website for updates. You see the, the our website on the screen below. Uh, Womanhood is a community-driven project, right? So we invite you to let us know the people and groups who made significant historical contributions uh, to your region, the district that you're living in, the city you're living in. You can nominate a woman by going to the website below, as I said, on the screen. You can also help us locate and identify site opportunities for women's public recognition across the county. Um, some of the questions we have are, what areas in your neighborhood or community holds historical significance? Are there open gathering spaces, trails, buildings, and other opportunities that we should be aware of uh, where we can recognize women in your area? You can identify those places on the Co-Urbanized website. Let us know by pinning your ideas and feedback on our womanhood map at the website below. Uh, if you need inspiration, visit Co-Urbanized uh, to read what other community members have shared, or you can send in your comments via text messaging. We just started this new program. You can find the phone numbers for each district on the website or take a, a photo of this image right here. Um, and your comments will be distributed to the district anonymously. Um, and you can do that from anywhere. So I want to say thank you again for joining us today. And we hope that you enjoyed this episode of Artists Honoring Women. <laughs>